Yeah, thank you very much for the, uh, for the kind introduction. I'm very glad to, to be here in Zurich to, to share my research um, with you and grateful to Thomas for uh, inviting me to, to this conference um, to present those parts of my research that relate to the First World War. So I should stress, as, uh, as Steve said, that I'm not an expert on the First World War as such, but that I'm writing a history of the concept of the West. Um, and so the First World War played a significant role in that, and that's, that's what I'm going to... Um, talk about, and it will be based on an uh, analysis of a vast array of, of newspapers and magazines from the US, Canada, um, Great Britain, and France. And the way I sort of want to do this is by, by making four claims or four arguments. And for those of you who haven't um, sort of read the article, uh, the abstract, um, yeah, let me um, uh, repeat those. Um, first, I want to show that the concept of the West was not a 20th century invention and did not suddenly pop up during the First World War, as several scholars um, such as Markus Lianke, Jürgen Osterhammel, or Philip Gussert have claimed. Uh, instead, I trace the origins of the notion that Western Europe and North America form a community based on shared political principles back to the 1830s. Um, second, um, I, in this, uh, uh, I shall argue that the concept of the West was used for propagandistic purposes during the war, particularly by the British who sought to convince the US to enter the war by sort of appealing um, to a transatlantic West. Um, third, um, I will show that as a result of these efforts and of the suitable political context that the war afforded the concept of the West, uh, that the use of the term Western civilization skyrocketed during the war, making it an established part of the political vocabulary in the countries um, I investigate. And finally, I want to show that the significance of the First World War for the conceptual history of the West also lay in the fact that it promoted the concept in the US. Before the war, the concept of the West as a political community had played hardly any role at all in the US which had traditionally defined itself in opposition to Europe and claimed democratic values for itself. But it was during uh, the World War I that the concept also entered the political discourse in the US and that the concept achieved a rhetorical importance similar to that in Great Britain, Canada, and France. Now let's start with, with the first point, uh, the origins of the concept. Now the concept of the West referring to a spatially congruent a uh, political community in the western part of Europe emerged in Great Britain in the 1830s in the context of an increasing ideological polarization uh, in Europe at the time. And I think it's no coincidence that it was at this time that the concept emerged because the Western Europe liberalized in the 1830s. There was the July Revolution in France um, that turned France into a parliamentary monarchy. In the same year, Belgium became independent, giving itself the most liberal constitution at the time. Great Britain, already a parliamentary monarchy, um, further democratized um, through the Great Reform Act of 1832. So the, sort of the, Western, the countries in the western part liberalized in the 1830s, whereas developments in, in the eastern part of Europe took a contrary turn. The Russian Tsar Nicholas I militarily crushed the Polish insurrection, suspended the Polish constitution, um, and annexed the previously semi-autonomous kingdom of Poland to Russia, and curtailed civil liberties. And a consequence of these diverging political developments in the western part of Europe, uh, in the eastern part of Europe, the concept of the West emerged in the 1830s. Um, and so um, it connoted um, a group of comparatively liberal systems um, in the western part of Europe and was set apart from what was perceived to be a despotic East that was equaled with Russia. And so it was in the 1830s that the you, that the term Western civilization was first used. Um, and this political ideological split, split between the states in the west of Europe and the eastern part of Europe um, de deepened over the course of the 19th century um, as France turned into a parliamentary republic. The principle of ministerial responsibility and the direct election of the second legislative chamber were introduced in the Netherlands. Um, uh, male suffrage would be continuously expanded in these countries as well as in Belgium and Great Britain. Oh, and of course, uh, since we're in Zurich, uh, Switzerland also democ further democratized during the 19th century, particularly through the Federal Constitution of 1848. And at the same time, Ru Ru Russia's image as the incarnation of autocracy also simultaneously strengthened 
as the Russian Tsar, kept ruling in absolutist fashion without being limited by constitutional restraints. And so this political, ideological East-West divide promoted the concept of a liberal West, um, whose initially only marginal relevance continued to grow over the course of the 19th century. And Germany, or so rather the various German states uh, place uh, on Britain's and Frenchmen's mental maps, um, remained somewhat ambiguous during the 19th century. They were usually not considered Eastern and thus put in the same category as Russia, but were also not heralded as, uh, as typically Western, but rather as something in between. And I think this is uh, closely tied to the geographical concept of Central Europe. This concept also emerged in the 19th century, um, and this put sort of Germany or the German states somewhere in between sort of the West, Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Um, any ambiguity about Germany's place within the concept of the West, however, was lost when the First World War broke out. And this brings me to the second part. Because the British, French, and Canadian press ideologically elevated the conflict to one that was fought between Western civilization and German militarism. The Toronto Daily Star explained in 1914 that the First World War was not a war about territory or resources, but between two civilizations based on opposing political principles. Quote, the two great Western republics, France and the United States, the two great constitutional monarchies, Great Britain and Italy, and most of the smaller states of Europe, as well as the self-governing states of the British Empire, have in common responsible government, democratic institutions, and a similar ideal of political liberty. From this point of view, the Western powers stand on a different side of the fence from Germany and Austria. We have watched with respectful interest Germany's development on her own lines, with monarchism, paternal government, the divine rights of kings, the preponderant influence of a military caste, and a form of constitutionalism which we regard as spurious. So the newspaper concluded um, that the war was between German, where Western civilization and Hunnish depravity or between Western civilization and German barbarism. In 1915, the Manchester Guardian also argued that Germany, quote, has built up a culture of her own, self-centered, based on a notion of the state, its claims upon the individual, and its rights against the rest of the world, which uh, we in the West repudiated. The Observer concluded in 1917 that, quote, in reality, the constitution of German life has nothing in common with that of Western civilization. Once Germany was united under Prussian leadership in 1871, the British newspaper concluded, quote, Germans began to foster a Germany shut off from and opposed to the West. Now, as newspapers tried to make sense of the war by representing it as an ideological conflict between two civilizations, the British government, not surprisingly, also used the concept of the West to justify British participation in it and the wartime alliance with France. In 1917, the British Foreign Minister, Arthur Balfour, explained at a banquet at the Savoy Hotel that Germany, quote, was a power which, if it were allowed to prevail, was going to destroy the very roots of Western civilization. More importantly still, Balfour also toured North America in 1917, relentlessly invoking the concept of the West to justify the participation of the US and Canada in the war. In a speech before the U.S. House of Representatives on May 5, 1917, he declared that in the First World War, quote, the free peoples of Western civilization fought against the military despotism of the German type. In a speech to the Canadian House of Commons, Balfour on May 28, 1917, also characterized World War I again as the struggle between democracy and autocracy, as the Globe reported. And at a banquet given later in the day at Rideau Hall, the British Foreign Minister again emphasized that, quote, this is becoming a world war between the powers of democracy on the one side and the powers of autocracy on the other side. British intellectuals, too, took part in this propagandistic effort appealing to the transatlantic West after the outbreak of the war to pressure the US uh, into declaring war against Germany and Austria. In 1915, the British intellectual Norman Angel, for example, published several articles in the New York Times in which he called on Americans to leave behind the assumption that, quote, America has nothing to do with Europe, is only the faintest degree concerned with its politics and developments, that by happy circumstance of geography and history, we are isolated and self-sufficing, able to look with calm detachment upon the antics of the distant Europeans 
and instead to realize that morally, as well as materially, we are part of Europe. If European civilization takes the wrong turning, we can by no means escape the effects of that catastrophe. In another article, he implored Americans to accept the fact that, quote, the isolation of America is an illusion of the map and that America is an integral part of Occidental civilization, whether she wishes it or not. Um, how much time do you have left? Uh, we've been talking for 12 minutes. Okay, so I'm good in time. Um, and in view of the fact that the concept of the West served propagandistic purposes during the war, it also slightly changed its meaning. Before the West had, or the concept of the West had not only connoted the group of comparatively liberal and democratic countries, but also at least in imperial contexts, and that of modern countries, um, with advanced technologies and industrialized economies. But since in this sense, Germany was certainly part of the West and before uh, the First World War was also sort of represented as a Western country in imperial context, as you know, in China or Japan, for example. Um, but Fu and others now needed to stress that democracy, or exclusively democracy, and not modernity, was the central marker of Western identity to justify the, justify the war against the central powers. And so while the connection to the semantic field of modernity um, was never lost entirely, the First World was certainly led to the concept of the West being primarily used to refer to the groups of democracies um, on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and as a result of uh, the concept of the West being used to justify the wartime alliance against the central powers during the First World War, um, the term Western civilization uh, was popularized experiencing um, a sharp increase in its usage. Actually, at this point, I wanted to show you charts of the frequency um, of the terms usage in newspapers, such as the Times or the Guardian or the Economist. Uh, but unfortunately, when I did the PowerPoint presentation, the flight to Zurich, I realized that I only have the data on my office computer, not on my laptop. So I sort of have to describe to you how, how this charts would look like. And it would show that in the 1830s, the term Western civilization first popped up, it was used rarely, just a few times, and then gradually increased, had a, f a sl slight peak during the Crimean War, which the British and French press also illogically elevated to a conflict between Western civilization and Eastern barbarism, um, and very gradually um, increased this curve. Um, but one should, we should not overestimate the importance that the term had in the 19th century. It was not used that frequently. And it was really just that the, when the first world was started that suddenly this curve grew exponentially. And you know, the term popped up anywhere. Um, um, and this uh, kind of curve looks very similar. You know, the curve about the frequency of the usage of the term Western civilization looks pretty similar, whether you look at the Times, the London Times, the Manchester Guardian, or the Economist, um, or the Globe, or the, the Toronto Daily Star. And admittedly, such charts reveal very little about the meanings um, of the concept of the term Western civilization, nor can the impact of the concept be deduced from such quantitative data. Um, however, what can be inferred from a steep rise in the frequency of the usage of the term is that the concept of the West became widely known and a standard reference in political debates about international relations. And I think this would prove highly significant, uh, highly significant later in the mid-20th century when the concept of the West helped policymakers make sense of the post-war situation after the end of the Second World War. Because by this time, it was such an established assumption that Europe um, was politically divided into a West and an East and that North America and Western Europe formed a political community uh, that one can reasonably conclude that the concept of the West was not only retrospectively used to justify the Cold War order, but it helped create it in the first place. Um, and now the other significant development that took place in the conceptual history of the West during the First World War, apart from its popularization in the British, Canadian, and French press, is, and this is the fourth and la last part of my presentation, it spread in the US. Originally, the concept of the West was a European concept, and not, a Euro not, a, not, a, not an American one. Um, not only was America politically removed from the developments and events in Europe, 
in which it took no direct part, such as the revolutions of 1830, the revolutions of 1848, and the Crimean War, and hence had little effect on how Americans defined themselves. More importantly, the democratic form of government was used to set America apart from Europe, rather than uniting them in a common community. After all, America's national identity as the exceptional land of liberty was predicated on the belief that Europe was not able to maintain stable democratic forms of government like the US. Um, so American statesmen and intellectuals had continuously interpreted the Atlantic Ocean as a dividing line, um, separating two hemispheres that operated and developed according to different historical and political laws. In America, the term West, and particularly the term Democratic West, refer to the American West, which according to the influential frontier thesis of Frederick Jackson Turner was the place where democracy, at least American democracy, was born. So Americans became more democratic the more they moved away from Europe, the more they escaped the cultural influence of Europe, the common American identity narrative went. As the, Ameri as the historian Daniel Boorstin explained in the 19th century, yes, America and Europe were used less as precise geographical terms than his logical antithesis. So not surprisingly, the concept of the West as a political community found no receptive audience in the US. The First World War, however, changed all this. Not only did it give a tremendous boost to the concept in Great Britain and France, where the conflict was ideologically elevated to a conflict between Western democracy and German autocracy, it also popularized the notion in the US where it was used to justify America's, America's participation in the war on the side of Great Britain and France. By introducing the war aims causes in 1918, which explained the reasons the US had entered the conflict to future soldiers at American colleges and universities, emphasizing America's democratic links to Western Europe and depicting the struggle as one for the survival of Western civilization, the Wilson administration helped spread the concept of the West to students across the country. And in the 1920s and 1930s, these courses were then transformed into mandatory Western Civilization Survey courses, such that Americans became used to accepting the concept of the transatlantic West as a statement of fact. Also, which we probably know is uh, that in 1917, the American publicist Walter Lippmann coined the term Atlantic community as a synonym for, for the West. So that was also uh, happening during uh, the First World War. Um, so in conclusion and in answer to the question of how significant the First World War was in the history of the concept of the West, I'd say that on the one hand, it did not give birth to the, to the West, as many people claim or think. Um, it had existed long before. And also, um, it, I don't think it had any influence on the outbreak of the First World War. So it was used retrospectively sort of to justify the war and the wartime alliance. But on the other hand, I think the First World War was a pivotal moment in the history of the concept of the West, because on the one hand, it really popularized the concept, indicated by the, the frequent usage um, of, the, of the term Western civilization, and that it also introduced it to um, the US. And this would prove highly influential in the later Cold War period, because of this concept of the West was, was the main argument that the Truman administration would use to justify America's financial and military commitments to Western Europe in the late 1940s and 1950s. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.